interactive uh, interactive and active and interactive discussion data or in the class in the field of the presenter. We had we had added material data on the field of the writers, the social perspectives, or the masters. وزاد قوم في نص ساعة هو التشالنج بتاعها الحقيقي. يعني السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبسم الله الرحمن الرحيم زي ما شفتوا الدكتور حسين اداني تو فيري لارج توبكس معلش هتستحملوني اه هبقى بتكلم فور يعني فترة طويلة شوية. أنا هبتدي بالهيستوباثولوجي أوف الفاسكولايتس أنا نوت جوينت تو جيت إن تو too much clinical uh, details and I'm going to try to cover as much entities as possible and I'm going to some form of يعني, like a demonstration or equal entities with terminology that we can use. Vasculitis, as per definition, is an inflammation of blood vessels. So, theoretically, it can affect any tissue and organ. It's very important to know in an accurate diagnosis of vasculitis that it needs very proper correlation of the pathological data with the clinical presentation of the with the serology, with the microbiological data, with immunopathological. The microbiological, and we need to remember always in that there is an infectious etiology behind vasculitis. And in our patients which can present with any vasculitic presentation, make sure that you exclude the infectious agent first, or that this is an infectious cause. Then the treatment and the way you are going to handle the patient will be totally different. As for non-infectious vasculitis, which is going to be our topic today, infectious vasculitis, I'm not sure any thing can cause uh, infectious vasculitis, bacterial, mycobacterial, syphilitic, rickettsial, fungal vasculitis, viral, as herbs, zoster, and so on. However, today we're going to focus on non-infectious vasculitis, which could be induced out the immunologic pathogenic mechanisms behind it could be one of these three four entities. Either it's an immune complex mediated vasculitis, as tension non-purpura, as pribulinemic, as systemic lupus, as patients with rheumatoid vasculitis, polyarthritis, medosa, bacid, and so on. It could be a direct antibody attack mediated vasculitis, as the Kupasur syndrome for the antiglomerular basement membrane antibodies, probably Kawasaki, it's not sure, but it's thought that possibly it is mediated by anti-endothelial antibodies. It could be anca mediated or antineutrophil cytoplasmic autoantibody mediated vasculitis as Wagner's microscopic polyangiitis, Jerk's Strauss syndrome, and so on, and some drug induced vasculitis. Or it could be a cell mediated vasculitis. And I want you to always to remember this entity. We have a tendency to always consider vasculitis as an antibody mediated disease. Although we do have entities which are cell mediated vasculitis. The commonest we see is the allograft cellular vascular rejection process for those who see transplants. Out of transplantation, we have joint cell arthritis, which is probably a cell mediated vasculitis, and a piezo arthritis, which is also probably follows the same mechanism. The nomenclature we're going to use today, or Or the classification I'm going to follow is actually the, uh, the Chapel Hill classification, which was a consensus made since 1994 and been updated later, and I'm going to tell you. This classification simply classifies types of vasculitis according to the size of the vessel. So we have large, large vessel vasculitis, and by large vessel we mean the aorta and its main branches. Then we have medium sized arteries, and by this, by the medium-sized arteries, we mean visceral, like visceral arteries, like renal, like hepatic, like coronary. This is where we refer to medium-sized arteries. Then we have small vessel vasculitis, and this would cover small arteries, arterioles, capillaries, and venules as well, and will include a lot of categories as we're going to see. The first is large vessel vasculitis. As I said, large vessel vasculitis usually targets the aorta and its main branches. And large vessel vasculitis could simply be considered as chronic granulomatous arthritis. And this chronic granulomatous arthritis have two main entities, which is what is known as the chiasso arthritis and joint cell arthritis. Very quickly, you know the chiasso arthritis is an arthritis which targets the usually, most commonly, the aortic arch. It's known also as the pulsus disease and it takes its major branches. 
patients of the cancer arthritis are usually younger than 50 years old. See this photo of Quentin Michelin. So you can see that you have thickening of the antima of the, this is the dentition, then you have the antima of the blood vessel, and you can see on pathology that this is all is media degeneration, all of this area, you have this dense inflammatory infiltrate, and you have joint cells, and the joint cells tells us that this is a granulomatous infiltration. The gastroarthritis can affect the renal artery and can cause renal artery stenosis, and the stenosis would be out of the healing process after the inflammation, and you can see all of this fibrous antimon infiltration. The second entity is joint cell arthritis, or more known as temporal arthritis, and you see that this is again a granulomatous arthritis of the aorta, its major branches, but it often involves the temporal artery. It has a specific predilection for it. This type of arthritis it usually occur in patients who are more than 50 years old and is often associated with polymyalgia rheumatica. And as you, this one has more abundant joint cells. You see these joint cells? These are the joint cells. You have the large cells and multiple nuclei. So this is what we call joint cells. There are one, two, three, and four joint cells. You have abundance of joint cells in this type of disease. And this is joint cell arthritis. The second type of Vasculitis is what is known as medium-sized vessel vasculitis and we like to refer to it as necrotizing arthritis. What do we mean by necrotizing arthritis? Necrotizing vasculitis usually begins with a segmental area, a small area which undergoes necrosis, or what we call necrotizing inflammation of the arteries. What happens is that you get infiltration by neutrophils and monocytes. This is usually followed by insudation of the plasma proteins and activation of the coagulation factors, which turns all of this into fibrin, and this is typically what we refer to as fibrinoid necrosis. You can see here, this is the blood vessel. This is an artery. All of this pink material is fibrinoid necrosis. That's the wall of the artery. This is the fibrinoid necrosis, and this is the inflammatory infiltrate which contains neutrophils and monocytes. And this is the lesion which we call necrotizing arthritis. We see necrotizing arthritis in one of the things in medium-sized uh, medium vessel vasculitis. I just want to remind you that a large artery in a small biopsy is actually a small artery. So when you take a biopsy and a small biopsy and you see necrotizing arthritis even in what we call in the biopsy as a big sized artery, I cannot, I can't really say. So I can differentiate between medium sized vasculitis and small vessel vasculitis on the level of the small biopsies. So always bear this in mind that it's not, we can't, for example, I cannot tell you whether this, this is polyarthritis medosa or microscopic polyandritis. And both would represent as necrotizing vasculitis. Yes. Yes, necrotizing vasculitis is the term we use for this, that you have this fibrinoid necrosis together with inflammation. The degree of inflammation varies. It could be more inflammatory and the necrosis is segmental or it could be more necrotizing. As I will show you, sometimes you don't see the whole wall. Yes? It's not biopsy. لا اللي انا بقوله ان بايوبسي صغيره لما يبقى فيها ارتري كبير يبقى الارتري ده صغير لان انت لو دخلت اصلا في ارتري كبير يو ويل كوز ستيريز دامج تو ذا بيشنت فريمبر ذس اللي انا بشوفه اندر ذا مايكروسكوب از ا لارج ارتري از اكشولي في الحقيقه از ا سمول ارتري لان في الاخر هي مضاد بروبورشنال تو ذا سايز اوف ذا بايوبسي فريمبر ان انت بعد بايوبسي قد كده يعني بوينت uh, 0.8 1 سنتيمتر 1.2 سنتيمتر في الاخر وات اي سي از ا لارج ارتري اور از ا ميديوم ارتري از از بروبابلي ا سمول ارتري It's probably a small artery because for the it's represented by a Okay, so I can say more can be a medium-sized vessel vasculitis, and then home types that involve small vessel. More can be a small vessel vasculitis, and then home types that involve medium size. Between these two entities, I can say in a smaller biopsy, I can I can tell you. Colon necrotizing.
necrotizing, we also need to know that all necrotizing vasculitis that enter as anything in our body, we enter a common pathway eventually of chronicity, chronic inflammation and scarring, as you see in the wall of the blood vessel. However, we, and we do find some lymphocytes and macrophages before and with some form of chronic inflammation. But we need to know that this could happen in time frame of one to two weeks following the initial injury. So it wouldn't be surprising if a patient came presenting full-blown as, as vasculitic and then by the time you take the biopsy and the biopsy is examined, you see no signs of vasculitis in the biopsy. That doesn't mean that the patient didn't have a vasculitic episode. Out of the medium sized vasculitis, the most known is polyarthritis nodosa. Polyarthritis nodosa is necrotizing inflammation of medium sized and small arteries. However, what is characteristic about this lesion that it comes without glomerulonephritis, all vasculitis of the arterioles, capillaries, or venules. So, all what we get, as you see here, I think this one is more clear. You see all of this pink. Material. This is extensive necrosis, fibrinoid necrosis. You see the inflammation, all of this inflammation is involving the wall of this artery. This is what I would call in a biopsy a large artery. And you can see here all of the inflammatory infiltrates, you have macrophages, you have lymphocytes. This is the trichrome stain or trichrome or muscle trichrome, which is basically fibrotic stain, but it's also very useful to give you a clue about the presence of fibrinoid necrosis because it takes this nice pink color against the background of green. Okay, I've, I've prepared very quick cases, just to extremely boring. Our first case is a three-year-old child who became irritable and febrile. The parents noticed red tongue and throat and swollen glands in the neck. They considered that this is a strep throat, so a fever was considered. However, after several days with lack of improvement, they decided to go to a pediatrician. On their way to the pediatrician, the baby became very agitated and entered into cardiopulmonary arrest. Once they arrived at the clinic, resuscitation efforts failed and the baby died. What do you think this baby had? Kawasaki disease. Kawasaki disease is the second type of medium-sized vessel vasculitis. This is an arthritis which involves large, medium-sized, and small arteries. And this lesion is associated with mucocutaneous lymph node syndrome. You see the characteristic of what's called strawberry tongue and the redness in the skin, usually in the scrotum, also in the scrotal area. And you have, again, this marked inflammation as you see here the necrosis is not very uh, conspicuous here the inflammation is more and this is in a bit of a large artery the coronary arteries are often involved in aorta and veins could also be involved and it usually occurs in children Thank you. now is small vessel vasculitis when we come to discuss the entity of small vessel vasculitis, which is again another type of necrotizing vasculitis, we can easily classify either into a new complex mediated vasculitis, like the entities we are all very familiar with, natural line purpura, cryoglobulinic vasculitis, lupus, full posture, rheumatoid, hypocomplementemic vasculitis, infection-induced immunocomplex vasculitis, and some of the drug-induced vasculitis or as post-immune and candidated vasculitis. We have what used to be called Wegener's granulomatosis. Is now there's a tendency that the name changes and it's called granulomatosis with polyangiitis. So granulomatosis with polyangiitis is Wegener's granulomatosis. We have microscopic polyangiitis. We have isenophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, which is Chirk strauss syndrome, and again, some drug-induced Vasculitis. So, a small vessel vasculitis is actually a necrotizing polyangiitis. Why do we call it this? Because it affects small arteries, arterioles, capillaries. You can also see it in the venules, and it can some of the types can affect medium-sized arteries. But usually, the commonest is capillary involvement, and hence these patients usually present with glomerulonephritis and pulmonary capillaries. But you can also still get infection of the arteries. For the sake of the time, I'm going to discuss only 
few entities of them, and I'll start by immune-mediated vasculitis, cryoglobinemic vasculitis. It is of specific importance for us. We are the country of hepatitis C. Up to 60% of hepatitis C positive patients have a cryoglobinemia. Trust the clinical and see if the patients have any form of vasculitis. If your HCV positive patient have any signs of vasculitis, cryo tests are not always reliable to be done in hospitals. So don't always count that it's cryo negative. That means that the patient that doesn't mean that the patient has no cryoglobinemia. Which ما هوش مصر عندنا بس وما هوش بس It's everywhere in the world. There is the test of cryoglobinemia is not very Reliable. So always remember with your HCV patients that you do have a risk of cryoglobulinemia. Cryoglobulinemia can be a serious vasculitis. You have vasculitis with cryoglobulin immune deposits affecting small vessels as capillaries, venules, or arterioles, and associated use with cryoglobulins in serum if can be detected. It affects the skin, the glomeruli, and often involved also patients, also parenchymal. Uh, vessels can be affected. This is again, this is another form of trichrome, but it gives blue other than green. And you can see this is a very small arteriole, and you can see the necrosis or this red, this very red color. So you have here the necrosis, you have the inflammatory cells, and you see it's swelling. This is a larger vessel, and you can see this is what we call endo vasculitis or proliferative inflammation, you have a lot of inflammation, all of this is inflammatory cells, all of this is in the endothelium, you can see small glomerulus with a crescent and yes, cryoglobulinemia does have crescents, yellow crescentic glomerulonephritis, mesh 50% crescents or 60% crescents, but a patient can be HCV positive, Cryoglobulin positive, out, he has HCV positive and has HCV renal impairment, and he has crescents in the biopsy. That doesn't make him a crescentic glomerulonephritis. It raises the suspicion that this patient is cryoglobulinemic with the presence of crescents. Typically, which is not always the case, or which not always cryos are that readily seen, but you can see this pink. Think this pink thrombus in the center, this is cryoglobulins. You have again smaller ones here, all of these small pink thromboides are the cryoglobulins, and this is a classic membrane proliferative glomerulonephritis, or what we call cryoglobulinemic membrane proliferative glomerulonephritis. The second one of immune mediated, also a uh, small vessel vasculitis, is good, good pasture syndrome, our anti GBM disease. A TGBM disease is essentially a small vessel vasculitis, affects the glomerular capillaries and pulmonary alveolar capillary, but it may occur as an isolated glomerulonephritis. It presents as a crescentic glomerulonephritis. Some, you have some clues that maybe sometimes we say that when we see the structure in the bone capsules, you see this is a silver stain, and silver stain stains basement membranes black. So you see this is a bone capsule, Shaykhana discontinued, henna. it's actually ruptured by the crescent. All of this is the crescent, a remarkable cellular crescent, and by immunofluorescence, it gives this linear pattern of IgG. Just to remind you that this linear pattern of IgG is only on immunofluorescence techniques. What we do usually on private bases or on small centers is immunoperoxidase. And in immunoperoxidase, which works on paraffin sections, meaning they take only one of biopsy, has formalin fixed. You don't need a frozen biopsy or anything, just this formalin fixed biopsy, which we do immuno studies on, cannot tell you whether this is anti GBM or not. It can tell you it's IgG positive, but it cannot say that this is anti GBM because this pattern, a described pattern with an anti membrane disease, is based on immunofluorescence techniques. Are you saying anti-IgG or anti-GBM? Is it specific? Anti-GBM antibodies, but that's IgG specific? No, IgG specific. Specific anti-GBM bodies with serology, yes. It's the pattern of the deposition. Okay. I can't remember the answer. I'm sorry, I need to tell you about fluorescence. You have a better chance in the... Need to, uh, to know it, but when we suspect anti-GBM disease, we, we, I need to go for the serology. 
as in a place where you perform in your fluorescence, you can you can know. Then Anka vasculitis. Anka vasculitis involves the three coming uh, following up entities, and the first one is microscopic polyangiitis. This is a necrotizing vasculitis. It has few or no immune deposits. She don't know yet to see immune, but we can't find these immune deposits, but they are very few, how much significant, much higher, prominent. It affects small vessels, capillaries, venules, and arterioles. And necrotizing arthritis, if it involves, again, small and medium size is present, with the commonest lesion is necrotizing glomerulonephritis. And necrotizing glomerulonephritis has a tendency to be segmented. So you see, this is a very nice normal glomerulus, and you see this area, and again, this very pink material is the necrosis, so this is a necrotizing GM, the same glomerulus with the trichrome, and you can see the swelling, the endothelial swelling, and the fibrinoid necrosis. This is a crescent, a full-blown crescent, and you have the tuft. Here, you see, this is all is a cellular crescent. This is what we call a fibrocellular crescent, which is something we see in all types of vasculitis. It's not specific for anything. The different ages of crescents, cellular, fibrocellular, or a fibrous crescents, any form of vasculitis can perform this, event, whether it's neomediated or anca. Vasculitis is just the nature of vasculitis, and fibrocellular means that part of it, as you can see here, has, still has fibrous, this green area, and part and the other part is cellular. Okay, our next entity is, um, is granulomatosis with polyangiitis, or what we used to know as Wagner's granulomatosis. Here we have a granulomatous inflammation, which is basically involves the respiratory tract and necrotizing vasculitis, affecting small to medium-sized vessels. Again, capillaries, venules, arterioles, but can involve arthritis and presents as necrotizing glomerulonephritis and a crescentic glomerulonephritis in the kidney. This is a granulomatous inflammation in the lung of the patient with Wagner's granulomatosis or granulomatosis polyangiitis, and you can see some scattered joint cells, which tells us that this is more or less is a granuloma. However, in the kidney, you get crescentic GN and an necrotizing <laughs> pattern. The third entity is isonophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, which used to be known as Joy Strauss syndrome. This disease is an isonophil rich and granulomatous inflammation. Again, it involves the respiratory tract, again, presents of necrotizing vasculitis, affecting small and medium sized vessels, but these patients have asthma and blood is in a fever. This is a typical necrotizing vasculitis affecting a small sized uh, blood vessel, and you can see this is a lung biopsy, and you can see granulomatous, these granulomas, which are rich in isenophils in patients with Schoen Strauss syndrome. So can we tell the difference between all of these cases? I'll give you a bit of a long, just a bit of a long, but interesting case. This is a 50-year-old male who developed a flu-like illness with fever, myalgia, and arthritis that cleared after a week, but was followed by the onset of runny red eyes and sinusitis. Two weeks later, he developed a rash on his ankles and lower legs bilaterally, diagnosed as palpable bilateral purpura. He was referred to a dermatologist who performed a skin biopsy. The diagnosis of severe leukocytic vasculitis consistent with hypersensitivity vasculitis was made. Remember, as I told you in the beginning, that vasculitis actually affects the nodes as well, and this is one of its main presentations in skin. And you can see this is what we call leukocytoplastic vasculitis. You have a lot of neutrophils and lymphocytes. Later, he developed massive hemoxis. His physical examination was the bilateral uh, on the lower extremities. He had nasal crossing and ulceration and bloody sputum. The radiology showed severe sinusitis and extensive pulmonary infiltrates. 
His labs at the time included serum crea 2.1, proteinuria uh, 3 plus, 2 plus hematuria with dysmorphic red blood cells, and negative serology for anti GBM, cryos, ANCA, and ANE. In his labs, he showed a non specific acute and chronic inflammation with no granulomas. However, a lung biopsy showed acute inflammation and hemorrhage, but again, no granulomas. The kidney biopsy showed necrotizing glomerulonephritis, again, a segmented necrosis in the glomeruli with 40% crescents. You can see the large cellular crescent and the necrosis in the glomerulus, but no granulomatous inflammation. Can you say that this patient is not muscularis? His vasculitis. Which type of vasculitis? Should it throw? The one with the lung will is better flat will get it. Yes, but we have because the region we have the lung will. But when they have the vasculitis, when they have vasculitis, they can involve the lung. They normally target the capillaries, so they take pulmonary capillaries in all cases. One of them supposedly will not cause granulomatous inflammation, which is microscopic polyangiitis. The other one is supposed to cause a granulomatous inflammation, but which is not eosinophilic rich, which is Wagner's granulomatosis. And you have the third one, which is the eosinophilic granulomatosis of CSS or Joy Strauss syndrome, which is supposed to have abundant eosinophil rich. The diagnosis of the nephrologist was that this is probably Wagner's granulomatosis, and the patient started treatment. The pathological diagnosis was that this was a case of cutaneous hepatic angioitis, acute and chronic sinusitis, pulmonary capillaritis, necrotizing glomerulonephritis, most consistent with microscopic polyangiitis. But Wagner's granulomatosis cannot be ruled out. My point is that although we have very strict tooling, we say that we have sharp uh, borders between the three entities and that we name them and have definitions for them, that does not mean that we do actually is we, that we are able to differentiate between them that easily. So in the context of anthospolitis, and this uh, that takes us back to my first slide when I said it really needs a very strict correlation between what we see in the pathology, between what the patient is presenting with, and between the rest of the serology. And this also is a chance to remind you that again, an anchor-negative serology does not mean that you shouldn't repeat it. Then eventually it will turn to be positive. So as a summary, we said that mainly vasculitis, we have large vessel vasculitis, pulmonary aorta and its main major branches. We have joint cell arthritis or temporal arthritis, which have a tendency to be to the temporal uh, artery. And we have the chiasso arthritis, which can cause renal artery stenosis. Joint cell arthritis in patients above 50 years old, but the chiasso arthritis are in patients be below 50 years old. And we have medium-sized uh, vasculitis, medium-sized vessel vasculitis, and polyarthritis nodosal, which, which presents without glomerulonephritis, it's just an necrotizing vasculitis. We have polyarthritis nodosa and Kawasaki disease, which comes with a mucocutaneous lymph node syndrome. So this is what tells us that this is probably Kawasaki and have a tendency to occur in children. Then we have the small vessel vasculitis. We have the long list of the immune mediated vasculitis. Some of them are easy more easily diagnosed as lupus and scryglobinemic as, as rheumatoid and so on. And we have the ANCA uh, vasculitis, which is the renal pulmonary syndromes, including microscopic polyangiitis, Wagner's granulomatosis, and Church Strauss syndrome. As I said, TSS is isn't rich. This one you would expect to see some granulomas at a certain stage, and microscopic polyangiitis, which is presented as necrotizing. يعني بس just to to comment on the choice of topic whether it was interstitial disease. Uh, we have to, uh, that actually a lot of vasculitic diseases does involve tubular interstitial and provides a tubular interstitial reaction. And we consider tubules and interstitial 
they, as they are always together because one injury to one of these compartments invariably affects the others. So we gather them as people with interstitial diseases. These diseases can happen in a wide variety of human and systemic diseases. It could be either primary or secondary. Then I'm going to focus on the primary disease, mostly a diagnosis that has an etiology of the underlying tumor interstitial disease on biopsy basis is not easy. Actually, it's rather quite difficult. It's not always easy to differentiate, and it is what we see as a picture is quite limited. How mainly whether this is a direct cellular injury or our immune-mediated mechanism. I'll start with tubular diseases, or what we consider pure tubular diseases, and the first one is acute tubular necrosis. Now this term, acute tubular ne necrosis, refers to acute deterioration of renal function due to epithelial injury. So what we most commonly use is the synonym of acute tubular injury. This term means that the necrosis is on cellular level. It affects individual cells. It's not geographical necrosis. And you should hit a good part of the tubules. Scattered fossae of necrosis. It's spoken. We limit it to a small percentage. It still causes acute kidney injury. Still, it can in acute renal failure. But it's the, the presentation, how much affected this. So we use acute tubular injury, meaning that this is mainly a sublethal injury affected small fossil. So these two terms are interchangeable. I tell the clinician that this is acute patient has acute tubular injury, the answer I get, oh yeah, ATM, and acute tubular necrosis. Okay, we are going to proceed. So these are interchangeable terms, but I just wanted to tell you what do we mean by acute tubular injury. Acute tubular injury actually is a very variable morphological thing. It can vary, you can see here, and this is a trichrome stain. The tubules get dilated, normal tubules, they have very rich cytoplasm. Will human be able to You can hardly see it. Shafin Hena, all of this white space is the human. Shafin cells, the flattened is there. Kul in Mogda is the cells. This is very flattened tubular cells, dilated tubules, and they are quite flattened. You can see here, this is another form of injury. We can see that there is almost diffuse cytolysis of the cytoplasm and the generation of the lining. It can get to be more severe and you can get focal necrotic areas. This is the necrotic tubular epithelium and it forms the spin cost, spin granular costs within the tubules. You can see it here again. And then that tubular epithelium brings completely denuded. You can, it's common to find some type, some amount of infantry and tubulitis in acute tubular injury, and you can get interstitial hemorrhage. The necrosis could be in wider areas, as you can see here. This is what we, if this, the whole biopsy is this way, then this is acute tubular necrosis. If the infant is more severe, you will get focal cortical necrosis, and in that case, it's not only tubular injury, it's also glomerular necrosis, it's common to find in necrotic areas neutrophilic infiltrate, they mean nothing. This is part of the necrotic area. We can sometimes have some things which can give us a clue to the underlying etiology. Vaculations, for example. Please remember that these are not 100% uh, for sure. This is just the clue. It tells us that they may be ATN that you can get acute tubular injury with vaculation. You see these very small vacuoles here in the tubular epithelium? This is more or less here, the tubular injury is not affecting the epithelium. See, these are the large, abundant isenophilic tubular cells, and it has this very little, in the iris, these very little vaculations. This is what we term isometric vaculation. You get it in a smaller, with a smaller uh, treatment, and the one more commonly, CNI, nephrotoxicity. It is related. But you can get you can get the tubular vaculation more coarse. See this is coarse hydropic generation. This is more bigger vaculation in the tubular epithelium and this is seen with um, ischemia. See the ischemia is like 
you can have the tubular injury with inclusions, myelin inclusions, whether you can have this out eye inclusion as in CMV, or you can have this type of inclusion as in BK virus or polyoma virus nephropathy. Or you can have it with costs. You can have something else with acute tubular injury. You can have it with myoglobin costs and patients presenting with rectal myelosis. This is again acute tubular injury, and you can see this pigmented costs in the tubules and remarkable tubular injury. Actually, the tubules are completely denuded in filtrichrome stain due to this bright red color, which is usually characteristic for myoglobin and, of course, to be confirmed by the myoglobin stain. Then the tubular interstitial nephritis. Tubular interstitial nephritis can be acute or chronic. A type of the infiltrate in the cells could provide a clue to the underlying etiology. Whether it's a neutrophilic predominant infiltrate, is a neutrophilic predominant infiltrate, or a lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate. But again, the differentiation between a tubular interstitial nephritis and acute tubular injury is a balance of what we see in the biopsy. If the tubulitis, which is crossing of the lymphocytes in the tubular epithelium, see this is this red thing is the tubular epithelium, and these are the lymphocytes here in the process, the tubular basement membrane. Sorry. So if the lymphocyte is not in the interstitial and it's in the tubular basement membrane, across the tubular basement membrane, we call this tubulitis, and this is what is <coughs> inflammatory. Infectious or uh, infectious uh, tubular interstitial nephritis, which is acute myelonephritis, and you can see here neutrophils. You, you actually get neutrophilic tubulitis. The neutrophils are inside the tubules. In acute myelonephritis, you can have micro abscesses forms with necrosis, and the characteristic thing is that you get this inflammatory causes inside the tubules. case D, a chronic myelonephritis. In chronic myelonephritis, you get interstitial fibrosis and you get this active inflammatory cause, which tells you that the cause of this chronic interstitial nephritis is probably a myelonephritis. As again, here, this is interstitial fibrosis tubular atrophy, but some of the tubules still retains this acute inflammatory cause. Xanthogranulomatous myelonephritis is a variant of chronic myelonephritis. It is also infectious, it's caused by E. coli. And here you get these foamy macrophages, not dealer aggregates of foamy macrophages, together with lymphocytes and neutrophils. Okay, and these patients are just chronic, but this is just a variant. This is a variant of chronic myelonephritis. Now, infectious tubular interstitial nephritis, are what is known as acute allergic tubular, uh, tubular interstitial nephritis, as you've heard, of course, non steroids and so on. And here you get an isenophilic rich. Uh, infiltrate. But I just want to tell you that this is another specific pattern. And any type of interstitial nephritis <coughs> with any underlying cause can present with monster that. Many of them are mediated, many of them are part of the vasculitic diseases, many of them part of glomerular nephritis, and so on. So the presence of xenophytes, without you telling me that the patient could have a history of non steroid drug abuse, is actually does not mean that this reaction is drug induced. This comes from a 19 year old female who presented with acute renal failure serum thread with a hack and nine, unexplained acute renal failure, and after digging, it been, although 19 years old, had a long history of non steroidal abuse. And this is her biopsy. I don't know if you can see, but can you see that there is granulomas here? There are these nodules. So, and see, this is a glomerulus, and this is actually a glomerulocentric granuloma. This is all macrophages, and this biopsy had a lot of xenophils in it. And this was granulomatous interstitial nephritis with xenophils drug induced. So not it can be a granulomatous tubular interstitial nephritis which is drug induced. This is a granuloma, and granuloma usually you have epithelioid cells, this large pink cells. And as I said, it can be non-specific, could be drug-induced, or could be more specific as tuberculous granuloma. You can get this lung hands joint cells. You can see the joint cells here, or a um, subcoid patient. We have a different type of infiltrate. This came from a two-year-old female child. She presented with acute renal failure. 
no pretori, no imaturia, her answer was very quick, her CBC was normal, the remarkable thing was the mark, the enlarged and swollen kidneys. Look, can you see any more renal structure? They had three cores, extensive infiltration. I usually get asked, we ask this question, can you, uh, what if this infiltration you're seeing is malignant? Can you really say that this is not lymphoma? Yes, malignancy shows. As you see, malignancy have this type of swiping infiltrate. inflammatory, and as you can see here, this is almost the only glomerulus which was left, and it's full, surrounded by malignant lymphocytes. This was LCA and CD20 positive, she was a B-cell lymphoma. We have other types of uh, nephropathies where we get uh, the positions. I just want to show you an example. Basically, what we call crystal uh, nephropathies, our tubular interstitial diseases with crystal deposition. You see here oxalates. And oxalates have a shape. It's not a matter of finding calcification or finding something polarizing in the biopsy. You usually get this thromboid, refractive crystals. Can you see that they are fancy? This is all the shape of crystal, and this is an oxalate nephropathy. It was a 25-year-old patient who ended in one stage. This is hypercalcemic nephropathy, and see the calcium. This is calcium phosphate in the tubules. See the extensive calcification. And these are actually uric acid crystals. Now here the crystals, they could look like oxalates, but if you look carefully, you will see that they are cleft-like. See here? Which is typical uric acid crystals with a granulomatous reaction around it, and this is the tophus. So what we call the tophus, and it was in the middle. Okay, this is my last thing, but I just want to focus on this point as we've been discussing that this is actually something So I want to alert you to it. We have a some form of an epidemic or a sudden increase um, in these cases. So I want you, Bastian, I think we discuss it. This is a 50-year-old female who presented with sudden renal impairment her serum can get 3.3 milligram. She has no history of hypertension or diabetes. Her investigations revealed potenuria 3.4 gram and her hemoglobin was 7.6. All her immunology profile was negative. Her serology can negative. She was not hepatitis C or hepatitis B virus positive. Her C3 and C4 normal. And this is her biopsy. Yes multiple myeloma. You can see tubular injury, and you can see this typical fractured costs, the defoheline costs, fractured again, typically surrounded by cellular reaction. This cellular reaction could be tubular cells, could be giant cells, could be inflammatory cells. Here are tubular cells surrounding the cost. Cost nephropathy can present as an acute, just an acute tubular injury with these costs. It can, as this one, as in this case, and you can see again the cost here is extensively fractured and with the inflammatory infiltrate. It could have some interstitial uh, inflammation without it, could present more commonly as a chronic interstitial nephritis, and you see the fibrosis, and you see a mixed inflammatory infiltrate. It can present with different type of crystals, which are needle-like crystals, like this one, do you see them? And this actually are highline costs because the nephropathy itself forms needed by crystals and these are costs and sometimes they are secreted with the shape of the crystals as you can see here and this patient also had fibrosis and it can present with interstitial amyloidosis isolated interstitial amyloidosis as this patient she had only very suspicious small costs and she presented with interstitial amyloidosis remember that we see the costs in the distal tubules, so sometimes in the cortex, even just the remark that you have scattered costs, if they are not abundant, that does not mean, if the biopsy is normal, that does not mean that this is not cost nephropathy. As I've been discussing with Dr. Muhammad and a lot of nephrologists, we are really seeing a huge number of 
my normal patients. This last year, I don't know if you share the same experience. Oh, but the number, I mean, I had something more. I never did a routine congruent. The body, any year, for 40 years, presenting with renal impairment, but we did a congruent and matching profile. We got what we were looking for. I just want to alert you that do not consider these patients a kidney injury. We are really seeing a lot of. Light chain. Remember, in the light chain, if you can have a non-secretory, the protein electrophoresis of the urine does not exclude that the eye has no myeloma or B-cell lymphomas. The two will do the same presentation. The two will do paraproteinemia, which will involve the kidney, any type of B-cell lymphoma. The regular protein electrophoresis does not exclude that. That does not exclude that. Or immune fixation negative excluded. I think if you have clinical Evidence and a serious doubt, and an IN could be light chain. You need to proceed even to bone marrow aspect. Okay, as we say, we see a lot of cases to so follow your gut and put it in your mind in the differential diagnosis these days. Just a hint that this is my last slide on tumor interstitial nephritis with a new complex deposit, quite an uncommon entity. It's more common to see it with glomerulopathies, the lupus, Jogman syndrome hepatitis B, non-steroid and anti-inflammatory and so on, but it can be a separate entity without glomerulopathy, but these diseases are really quite rare. Thank you very much. <laughs> أنا بهديك على سلاسل الزوز يعني حاجة يعني حاجة وجميلة جدا جدا أنا ليه بس يعني تعليق على موضوع اللي هو يمكن إحنا بن under estimate المشكلة في حتى في جست وصول جنسيميشن وساعات بنشخص حالات إيمي مش إيه إنه مش عارف واحد زي كده لأن إحنا بنعملش روتين يمين فلورسس مايكروسكوبي يتارجتين لايت تشين يعني لما الفترة اللي أعتمع طول المترين كده كان يا يسبب اي جي جي في شيء كابا ولندا روتين فبالشكل فما كان وما وما يقارنش بالعين لازم يحط الصوره ويقارن الصوره فكان بيكتشف حاجات كتيره جدا من كابا لايت او لندا لايت تشين للدروسيشن الحقيقه طبعا يور رايت انا لما كنت بشتغل في القصر العيني في الاميون واحنا كنا بنعمل ال السبعه بس احنا ما كانش عندنا يعني عشان بس تو بي فير ما كانش عندنا الارجنسي قوي لما تيجي بقى عندنا ما كنا بندوت اون ذا بايوبسي بيزز كنا بنبروسيد لكوبر نان طبعا وانت يو كانت داوت على البايوبسي بيزز زي ما انت قلت ان البريو بس بما ان احنا عندنا بما ان احنا كان دايما عندنا اكسبلين كوزز اوف البريو بروليفريت والبيشنتس بتوعنا كانوا يونجر ايج بوبيوليشن دي نوت داوت بس انا مع دكتور حسين توتلي احنا ناو وي ار سين كومبليتلي different thing. I am sure light chain not in our sclerosis for 37 or 35 years. Then I will check off myeloma in our 42 or 43, which is the age of myeloma, by the way. Can it be that when I got the name, I will know that multiple myeloma D is not a common tumor. كنا بنشوفها very often. The way it's really extremely common. I am not sure that we will look on it. I am sure. أنا بخاف عندي يعني اللي جاب بايوبسي كان أنا اكسبلين خمسة ستة في الأسبوع احنا عندنا اه احنا عندنا بيك بيك في البيشنس وساعات زمان كنا الستريكت بتاعت 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 وبعدين بقينا كلنا بنحكي الموضوع خلينا نتكلم انا مثلا بشوف قصدي انا بشوف احمد ماهر بعتلي احمد ماهر بعتلي حد تاني انا فاكر ان انا حد قريتها على الفيسبوك بعتلي حد تاني وحضرتك قلت لنا فعلا والكومنت ده بتاعك وصل لنا ان مالتيبل ميلوما ان هو مثلا ايبيديميك بس بقت منتشره جدا يعني ايوه وبعدين اتكلم ان الفرولوجيست كل الفرولوجيست بلا استثناء يقول احنا بنشخص على الثلاث حالات دلوقتي افري ويك وديفرنت نفرولوجيست في ديفرنت سنتر يعني دول اللي بيجوا من غير يعني انا اللي بيجي لي الاند سبيكتر لكن كمان في الناس اللي بيجوا بريم في اوريدي دايجنوز من الهيماتولوجيكال يعني من الهيماتولوجيكال ما اعرفش غالبا اتس سمثينج احنا كنا اكسبوزد احنا حاولنا كده يعني اسبس كده عشان ما عرفناش نوصل لحاجه غالبا حاجه كنا اكسبوزد ليها من 15 20 سنه بس وات اي كان تاليو ان هو ما هواش مصر هو it's a worldwide increase. 
بس بس مصر اه بس احنا يعني لا احنا اخر ثمان اشهر الموضوع الزين ما بيعطيش اسبوع من غير حاله معلومه وتشيز ا فيري هاي في اسابيع بتبقى حسب العينين